gaining muscle is hard. I'm just gonna keep saying it. Yeah. It's, it's true. But, and everyone wants to look good and lean, uh. but you can't really have the muscle showing if it's not there to begin with. You get lean. You're just gonna get lean and you're just gonna look skinny. Yes. 100%. <laughs> if that's your goal, that's okay. Yeah. But if you want to also have muscle, then it takes a lot more time. Than that. Yeah. Taking time to be maybe a little bit more uncomfortable than normal and not having, mm. like, you won't have a six pack, sorry, for maybe like a year. But when you decide to get leaner again, you have a six pack and you'll have muscles too. Totally. So it's like, but but that is a huge mental investment. And sometimes people struggle with that. Yes. Again, maybe like that's why research can help us out. And that's why people like you, like Eric, people who are, who are getting this content out there, for people to listen to it, be easy to understand. Mm. People, that's super important to do. You know, say, hey, it's okay to gain weight. Like you should gain weight, or it's it's really fine. Or trust me, or have someone you can trust for that process to put you on the right path. And yeah. Be like, hey, coach, I trust you. I, I'm a little bit like I. I I'm, I have some more body fat than normal, but I feel really good. Uh, and you say that when I get there, when I get leaner, the muscle will be there. I'm trusting you. Mm-hmm. And then typically it works. Alrighty, guys, we are back. Episode 20. This will be the final episode of 2020. So kind of fitting that it's episode 20. Um, just quietly proud of that, to be honest. I mean, we started this thing. I keep saying we. I started this thing. I think it was around February we had the first episode that came out. So we're talking 11 months or so of podcasts. And I was kind of aiming for maybe one to two episodes a month. So usually, usually you know, one a fortnight. Um, and managed to stick to that considering the the tumultuous year we've had. Um, and I had a few plans this year to go overseas and do some podcast tours. But, you know, it didn't eventuate. And we sort of pivoted and went with the flow like everyone else in the world. So... Here we are, episode 20. This is a really cool conversation with Colby Souza, who, as you guys know, most of you guys will know, I did a weight gain study. I was a participant in a research study at AUT here in Auckland. Um, and the study was p- specifically looking at muscle gain and rates of weight gain uh, and how, you know, the, the correlation between how much weight you gain and how much muscle mass you gain or fat mass you gain. So that was an eight week study, and I was a part of that underneath. Um, Colby as as my trainer for that time um, and we sort of discussed this study at length throughout this episode what were the methods used what were the um, what was the hypothesis of the of the study in the first place like what are they trying to find out and I guess ultimately you know what's the proposed outcomes from the study because the study hasn't actually finished gathering data as of yet so we discussed the study at length all of the intricacies of that how I found it um, and then of course we jump a little bit into Colby's story. Now, by way of introduction, um, Colby, you know, is a researcher, a PhD student at AUT University here in Auckland, where he studies under the watchful eye of Mr. Eric Helms, Dr. Eric Helms, who we've had on the podcast in the past talking all about protein research. Um, Colby got, does come from stateside, so he had a lot of time at FAU University over there studying under Dr. Mike Zurdos, who we do cover in this uh, conversation as well. And he's published some research around the assessment of accuracy of rating of perceived exertion. So if you don't know what that is, RPE, something we use within training to assess how hard a set is. Um, and we're going to cover that throughout this conversation and give you some tips and techniques on how to use RPE within your training to ensure that you are you know, not over overworking your sets, but also not underworking those sets where you're not then gaining the, the stimulus that is required for hypertrophy or for strength gain. So Colby's the man to talk to about RPE, so we cover that in detail. Um, and also a fair bit of detail around program design. How do we design for muscle growth? And how does that compare to designing programs for strength gain? So if you're interested in either of those two sort of goal outcomes, then this is a great episode for you. We also discuss a little bit about why both myself and Colby currently follow full body training splits, um, what the efficacy of those training splits are, and why I program a fair bit for my clients using that same training style also. So guys, it's a big episode. It's going to take a little bit to get through. Hope you enjoy it. Colby's a great guy, a lot of fun to be around, and uh, this is going to be a good way to round out 2020 on the VBC podcast. I'll be back with a special recap episode early 2021 where we're going to run through some of the most popular or you know most impactful episodes from the year, recap some of those, give you guys some gold nuggets to take away, uh, and then we'll be cracking into the 2021 season, which I'm super excited for uh, with the guests that I've got lined up. So hope you have a fantastic Christmas, a phenomenal New Year's. Get amongst the training, get amongst the food. 
have some great conversations with the family. Uh, you know, remembering a huge part about that communication is sharing your story, not telling someone how to eat or how to live their life, but just sharing what you're doing and how it's impacting you. So that's enough rambling from me. Let's actually get into the episode and stop having me talk about the episode. Instead, you can just listen to it. So I will see you on the other side, guys. This is episode 20 with Colby Souza. You are listening to the Vegan Body Coach Podcast, all about optimizing your strength, fitness, and physique through a plant-focused diet. My name is Jackson Burton, and I'm a nutrition and training coach for vegans, the plant-centric, and plant curious. I'm sitting down with athletes, experts, and influencers around the world to inspire you to create your best vegan body yet. Oh my goodness. Okay. Are you are you ready to are you ready to crack into this? Never, but yes. Have you got your your drink handy? If I can't leave it on the table, is that okay? Is that not gonna be yeah, okay? Put it on the table. Look how cute it is. It's lilac. Put it on the table. Oh, give me water, water. <laughs> you got yeah. that? You got that freaking that bro jug? Yeah, <laughs> uh, obviously, bro. Come as, on. As, as long as it's not a, a three liter like bottle of. It used to be a three liter carton of milk, and then they just <laughs> emp- and then they use it for water. I I have one of those, but I save it for for, oh, for, for bro, training for bro days. Bro yeah, days yeah, yeah. So it's like, oh, bicep, tricep today. Bicep, yeah. Boom. I'm just doing chest today, so I need my bro jug. Yeah, yeah. Mondays, oh, you know what I'm at, bench <laughs> bros. <laughs> Oh, okay. Should we do it? Let's do it. All right. Ready. So, Colby, welcome yeah. to the Vegan Body Coach Podcast. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, man. Well, I've been trying to get you out here for a little while. Um, yes. You've been avoiding me, so I've been no, pestering you. Not avoiding you, just <laughs> science and stuff. And science. Real life stuff. There's more important things, right? Yeah. Than <laughs> talking to a, a vegan body coach. Um, Never. You're always number one. Oh, thank you, man. <laughs> so, the people probably have some idea of who you are because I posted about you a few mm-hmm. times on the Instagram, but... Um, for the listeners, um, let's give a, a quick backstory intro. Who do you are? Yeah. Um, what you're into, and then how exactly like we came to meet, yeah. and and what happened in that in that instance. Yeah. Um, well, my name is Colby Souza. Hey. Um, I am current. I have a lot of roles. I've had a lot of roles. Currently, hold different roles. But uh, primarily, I'm a PhD student uh, based out of Auckland University of Technology, where Dr. Eric Helms is my supervisor. So that's like my, my main thing. Um, I'm from the United States, if you can't tell by this American accent. Uh, <laughs> so I, I did my undergrad at University of Rhode Island. I worked with Dr. Disa Hatfield. And then I did my master's at Florida Atlantic University, where I worked with Dr. Mike Zordos. So I just really like school. And I'm also trying to avoid adulthood as much as I can. So I just yeah. continue to school. Uh, <laughs> so after this PhD, I don't know what I'm going to do. Probably more school. You need more something. school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Find some master's to do. Yes. Like, oh, video game design? Sick. Let's of course. Do. Uh, but yeah, so primarily student. Um, and then I have research assistant roles. So like like you said, I have involved with a bunch of different uh, research projects going on, uh, some of my own, some of my friends and colleagues, and then some I just like to help out with. Um, so researcher, I'm a coach, I guess you could say. I have a couple mm-hmm. different uh, clients or friends I just like to coach um, from all across different backgrounds. It could be elite power lifters. It could be people who just want to start getting into the training or those in the middle, maybe some bodybuilding, a little bit of everything. I just really like to have some type of coaching role because I like to get people interested in the resistance training and how to do it properly mm-hmm. and to have some sort of, you know, like plan, you know what I mean? So it's like guidance of that. And then ideally them just being on their own to know how to train. So some coaching role there. Um, what else? What else do you want to know about me? Man, I think that's, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, I, nowadays my whole life is research and some coaching. So research, coaching, and, and anime. anime. <laughs> yeah, there it is. You can't forget. I, like, you can't. I don't think we have enough time to talk about all the anime and video games, so I'll keep that to, to a low. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can't we tell need, anime we need another like six hour <laughs> podcast for your anime expeditions. Yeah. Tune in, guys. Stay stay tuned. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> you did get me to watch a, a single anime episode. So you did well on that. On that, we won't tell everyone that it took you like four days to watch a twenty-minute episode. But yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I only got the one episode in, and I'm still yet to watch the second. I'm sorry, bro. See, see. Um, okay, so like, I mean, well, I, I know we've talked about it a little bit. So, like, what took you? Like, what actually got you to the point of wanting to dive into research yeah. and and study? Because I mean, that's definitely not. Um, the average route someone goes down, and so you're obviously interested in, in lifting from the from a younger age. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you go from sort of just recreational lifting to wanting to be the actual researcher? Yeah, yeah. So to to sum up my my life story, yeah, uh, pretty quickly. It's basically <laughs> yeah. I I started off I, as a kid and didn't play any sports. Uh, I ended up being really overweight, 
And then I was like, you know what? The those guys in American football, they they're pretty big like me. So let me try to play that. And I think those it was jocks. Age, yeah, yeah. I was like ten years old. Like, yeah, I could do that. I can be the the lineman and, and protect and push people around. That sounds fun. <laughs> uh, but then the first year I went to go try out. They I didn't make the team because there was a weight limit because you know they don't want people crushing little kids. Oh, like, as oh me, you so yeah, like, you were too heavy. Yes. For the oh wow. Yeah. So that was kind of discouraging for me, especially yeah. at young age. It's like, well, I can't do the thing that I thought. I could do and I'm mm. trying to be active so mm. that I just from there I just started to you know read the magazines mm -hmm. bodybuilding.com I was on there all the time just mm -hmm. started to teach myself or try to teach myself how to eat properly how to train properly just to lose weight primarily um, and I, I didn't have like anyone else that kind of could tell me because like my parents didn't really know much about it uh, and then my brother didn't know too much about it so it was like me just going on my own finding out to learn about it and I really yeah. fell in love with that learning aspect yeah for yeah. sure yeah and then that's how I kind of got into oh I really liked learning about all that stuff and I also don't want other people to kind of go through what I did in terms yeah. of that bad feeling and, totally. and I realized how beneficial lifting and proper nutrition is not only for me physically but mentally so it's like I'm gonna go to school for that. So then, totally, man. Yeah, went to. I mean, so like real common. I mean, I I have like I feel like I have a similar journey in terms of when I got into training, mm -hmm. I fell in love with the process of learning like yeah. the right ways, and and obviously probably wasn't learning from the right spaces because. I guess like probably when we both started, there wasn't a lot of spaces to go to. It was like, hey, you've got bodybuilding magazines and you've got the other dude at the gym and then you've and then eventually like found bodybuilding.com, like forums and there was all that kind of stuff. And then there was like the YouTube scene that started to come along. And then I guess, yeah, I guess it, it wasn't there wasn't a huge amount of information out there. But yeah, falling in love with that process of what can I do better, how can I get better? Um and be willing to change the whole time as well and adopt new things yeah. but um i think that sometimes i think that sometimes creates the best coaches mm -hmm. is the ones that are, maybe they potentially don't see the best response from training initially mm -hmm. but they're not discouraged from that lack of response and they dive further into how they can yeah. be more meticulous with their training protocols or nutrition or whatever to get the result and that creates a really good coach as opposed to like someone who just responds amazingly well to anything they do mm -hmm. you know, based off like genetic traits or whatever and then they don't sort of go down that route of learning they just kind of go hey just do this like it, it worked, worked for, for me, me. Yeah, exactly yeah so yeah that and like you said so you you were saying that maybe not the best information at first like i did all the wrong things yeah 100 like, i was like yeah, low carb diet sounds great. Don't eat after six PM. That makes sense. Yes. Things made sense to me, whether or not I knew it was true. And yeah. the way people presented the information was like, "You're going to sleep, so your body's not working." So yeah, you're going to I was like, yeah, it makes, yeah, makes sense. sense. Yeah, it totally yeah. does. Yeah. yeah. So I was doing all the wrong things. At, yeah. And and but I'm still glad that I was able to because, like mm. you said, I've learned from them, mm. and it makes it makes me a better coach, a better lifter, a better I think it's a better person in general because you know you don't want to. No one can do all the right things all the right time. Yeah. And, and if you do, you miss out on that experience and, and that, you know, that knowledge of doing things wrong and learning from it and getting better. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, totally. And then you and then you sort of got into yeah. actual research and sort of I guess what took you down that route of like wanting to like was there something specific you wanted to actually figure out from yeah, research? So so I so when my undergrad and I was just studying exercise science and I really liked it and I liked it so much that I ended up finishing a whole year early because I was like taking as many classes as I could. Really? I like, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. insane. And like, my teacher's like my advisor. She's like, you know, you could probably graduate early because you've just been really taking classes. And yeah. Like, cool. Like I can go on to the next level. Wow. That sounds good. That's awesome. And then, so my last year, she was like, I think you'd really like research. Mm. Um, you just, And just trust me, come to the lab and then figure it out. So I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I like to try things because I wanted to figure out what it is I wanted to do because I had no idea. I still have no idea what I want to do, you know, but trying different things and, and figuring out what it is that I want to do is important. So I came to the lab, was involved with like a, a research thing and I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh yeah, this makes sense. And then, yeah, yeah. And, then, and, and yeah, So, it so it, it's not that I just hate it. I didn't get involved in the right type of research. Mm. So so at first it was like, okay, cool. You're going to be, like your role in this research will be doing some blood analysis and some uh, like measuring soreness and all this. And like, I was like, okay, that sounds decent. And I was like, but uh, being in the, in the in the lab and just pipetting blood yeah. and doing these things. And it was, it was not fun to me. I'm very much a people person. I like being around people. Um, so I was like, wow, research, that, that sucks. I don't want to do it. <laughs> so then I was like, oh, I still like school. So I'm going to do my master's and I'll figure out what I'll do there. Went to my master's and uh, first class with Dr. Zardos. Um, I was like, hey, I went to go talk to him after. I was like, I was the guy that was emailing you all month, all like summer, like just worried about if I was getting in or not. Yeah. I, they like lost all my paperwork and everything, but I ended up going there. Uh, and I was like, 
I want to make the most out of my time here at FAU. So what can I do? And he's like, come to the lab. So I was like, oh, research. I know what this is. It's boring stuff. So the, fir the first day when I show up to the lab, I'm looking for the lab. And I was like, where is it? Is, is it this door? He said it was this number in the door. And there's this metal music blasting in the back. I'm like, nah, there's no way. <laughs> that laboratory is a strict research facility. <laughs> yeah, there's no and white coats and everything. Yeah. So I was like, there's no way this is this. So I kept walking around. Like, Maybe it is. Open the door. There's a couple of dudes just there lifting with like Lico bars and Lico racks. And it's just like Metallica blasting. I'm like, hey, is this the research muscle lab? <laughs> like, yeah, man, what's up? Like, hey, yeah, Zoros told us you're coming in. Come in. I was like, I love this place already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like, this and is my people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So then, then basically, long story short, I found out like that is also research. You know, just doing mm -hmm. training studies and figuring out like, hey, what is a good way to make people strong or a good way to build muscle? And let's study that. Mm -hmm. So these questions that I've had for my whole life, basically, like I didn't know I can turn that into technically doing the research. Yeah. And like that's what I was looking for. But I didn't know I was looking for it till I actually got there. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I had to make those couple of mistakes too beforehand to figure out, nope, that's not it. Or yeah, I didn't like research, but I'll give it a try. I trust Zordos. He said to, to do it. So sure. And then I fell in love with research through my master's. And then that's why I also wanted to continue with the PhD. And just like you said, the theme is overall just answering questions. Yeah. I, like I, said, I love learning, yeah. asking questions, answering questions, continually learning because you know just because you have a phd doesn't quit there or just because you have a master's doesn't quit there so you're continuing learning and putting information out there so that other people can learn that's the biggest part for me too is just mm. bringing making the science because science can be tough to understand sometimes mm. or it could be people might be afraid from it but making that just super easy to understand like what does that mean for me how can i take that into the my training tomorrow yes. or my nutrition tomorrow and that's kind of what i want to do totally yeah there has to always be that kind of like practical mm -hmm. um outcome from what you're doing is like hey cool there's like all this data but what does it mean for you yeah. and your in tomorrow's league session or whatever you know whatever it may be so yeah. um but i think it's like so important for and i talk about this a lot with people is like when you find that thing that is easy to learn mm -hmm. like you actually want to sit down and read this article or whatever yeah like maybe that's the thing you can dive more into you know and like with you it's like with your studying training and, and it's probably stuff like me when i was like coming into fitness was just sitting down and like trying to read every article I could on this topic and I'm doing it in my spare time. It's like, and what I, what I didn't realize at the time is that like, that's like, that's like educating yourself like I would have done at school and hated it because I'm just reading like math textbooks or something yeah. or biology or whatever. And then now it all kind of comes full circle. It's like, oh, now I can... I actually can learn properly because I'm so excited. I'm so like intrigued by the the answer or the outcome. Yeah. Um, it just makes it so much easier for you, right? Oh, so yeah. it was a natural progression for you, right? For for in my undergrad, actually, I learned a lot in, in classes for sure. But I, I'm also, like I said, a very hands-on person. I, I like to be in the lab. I like to, to take things more practically. I, I don't like taking exams and tests and all mm -hmm. that. It's just boring to me, but I still did well in school, obviously. But I... I, I could recall that my three years of undergrad, I think I learned more through listening to podcasts, walking from class to class <laughs> yeah. than I did. That stuff that I actually used today, yep. like listening to, to Lane Norton, listening uh, to yeah. Eric Helms, listening to like all, all, all the people. And it's like, I, that's the stuff that, you know, we can use today. Like share mm -hmm. the stuff in that you need to learn the stuff you do in school, like physiology and anatomy. And that's important to have that baseline. But in terms of like practical stuff mm. that I can use, the podcast helped me so yeah. much. Yeah. So there's this kind of link between you winding up in New Zealand mm -hmm. where you are now and you meeting Mike Zuros. And and do you want to explain, I guess, the listeners who like Mike Z is like, yeah, you, you yeah. Know, they probably have no idea who this oh, guy is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, <laughs> so Dr. Mike Zuros, um, he is phenomenal one. Uh, he does he does a lot of research in resistance training, specifically with uh, RPE or rate of perceived exertion based stuff. So he kind of did some of the first research on that scale. So like mm. quantifying how difficult exercise is and seeing how useful it can be in a training program. So like most of the research that comes out of the FAU lab has been based off of that and mm. other things too, but primarily that. Um, so I, I heard about him from Elaine Norton podcast oh, like yes. years, years ago. And I'm like, that guy just has way with words and he can make things simple and he's very passionate about what he does. And I just, I want to learn from him. Mm. And I, I think he'd be a great mentor for me. Yeah. So that's when I applied for a master's, I was like, I'm going there. Like, I, 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 I applied for other schools for safety, but I was like, I'm going there. Um, so I, I got to, and I'm super grateful that I was able to go there because I learned so much yeah. and, it's, and it was really good. And then my first year there, Eric Helms was actually 
there was doing his data collection for his PhD. So I was like, oh, I've heard of Eric Helms too. I, like, I listened to all the podcasts. Oh, and all, I read yeah. all I muscle and strength pyramids. I've watched that video so many times. <laughs> yeah. YouTube, like too many times. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's like I got to work with him in person. And in that, again, solidified even more like how great of a mentor he would be for mm -hmm. me. So I was like, PhD, Eric, wherever you're going, I'm following. And mm -hmm. he's like, I'm in New Zealand. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> you know, like, where's New Zealand? <laughs> oh, yeah. Australia? Is that Australia? Is that, yeah. is that, is that like over the bridge? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of close, right? Because the, the earth is flat. So <laughs> no, 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 it's not. So. <laughs> but yeah, so I was like, essentially when it came to, to finding mentors and learning, I was like, find the people who will be the best fit for me, who will be uh, people who challenge challenge me to grow, who support me and and just have a lot of knowledge to begin with but also are just really good human beings and obviously mm, Zordos and totally. are phenomenal people yeah so, so true like, you know finding people that you can really learn from like just and, and ask questions be around them as much mm. as you can like that's what i wanted to do so i like, just pick the two those two people who happen to be really well yeah yeah i mean you got you got in some you got in the good books there man with like mm. two very very like quality people but you know prolific researchers yeah. and they know the science and i mean I, don't, I haven't met mike but i obviously i know eric and you know even I'm always like, it's not just the ability to disseminate um, information and communicate science. It's, it is the, the relational side of how they interact with humans. Right. Yeah, sure. And so like even every, every interaction I've had with him um, and interactions when, when he was training here at the gym mm -hmm. with our members, it, it just, that speaks more to me is like how they interact with just the lay person who yeah. comes up and says, Hey, like, what are you doing? Like what, he was doing Olympic lifting and someone asked like, yeah, what, what is that? Like, what are you up to type thing? And, and then he's throwing he, stuff over your head. That yeah. Dangerous. Yeah. That's <laughs> wild. Like, um, he didn't CrossFit. Like, so, um, so, you know, just that kind of, I that humility, I guess, to be able to, you know, just give someone their time, yeah. um, which is so important. And so I think you've come to a really good, a really good place with that kind of trajectory of your life, right? It's finding these people to study under and to learn from and, and now be like, I guess, colleagues with, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that brought you to, to AUT and now you've been working like with Eric or Eric's been overseeing a lot of the research you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that brings us to like this, this whole weight gain study that I've been posting on my Instagram for a little while. Yeah. Um, I saw Eric post about the weight gain study, um, something, you know, hey, we're going to do the study about gaining weight or whatever. Mm -hmm. And because it was like basically during or I think it was between the lockdowns here in New Zealand or something like that. And there was like literally I couldn't fly anywhere. There's nothing else going on in my year. It was like, hey, this is probably like the best opportunity I have to mm -hmm. to just stick to something for eight weeks, 10 weeks, whatever it was. And not, um, I guess, yeah, not have anything else pulling me away or like, hey, I need to cut because I'm going to Bali or yeah. I need to... Um, you know, fly off here or do this other training because we've got like Spartan race coming up or whatever. It's like, hey, I can just like stick to the study. And also what an amazing opportunity for me to take the opportunity to be a part or a participant in actual research, right? Instead of like when I look at a, a, an article or, or a paper or something and I see these like data points, it's like, hey, like I can actually be one of those data points and yeah. see how this whole thing is done. Because mm -hmm. I guess from like when you're from the outside, like you're in for research, but me on the outside, it's like, what does research actually entail? Like, how does it work? Like, you hear these guys like Eric and stuff talking about what happens in a lab. What does the lab look like? Are they wearing white coats? Yeah, like, yeah. what is going on? Like, so, um, yeah, it was a great opportunity. So I was like, cool, I'll sign up to this thing. Um, so, like, I guess with this particular study, this weight gain study, do you want to sort of outline what the initial sort of reason we wanted to set up the study in the first place, what we're trying to figure out, um, and then why that's important for for people to know yeah yeah no absolutely um and then just real quickly he said like, i'm excited to research and what's it like and then you got stuck with me so oh yeah sorry, what, a, what a let down <laughs> to be honest I and mean, it was eight weeks and it was eight thankfully weeks. not 10 like you thought oh, yeah, eight weeks of hell, it. Man. <laughs> but yeah so um right off the bag it's like gaining weight <gasps> people get sometimes oh. get, get afraid of that um, yeah but like that's that's another reason why we wanted to do this study. So technically, this is Eric's study, mm -hmm. and, and me and a couple of other students there were just research assistants. So we we're mm -hmm. helping collect the data, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and the like we said, there's not that much research looking at gaining weight. There's a lot in losing weight, and we know quite a bit about it. Um, and you probably e it's probably easier to get participants for those ones. Yeah, yeah, they go, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. I want to lose weight. Yeah. <laughs> gaining weight? No way. Oh no, 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 no. no, 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 no. I'll spend my whole life trying not to gain weight. I don't want to gain yeah. weight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, and then another reason why we, this study is super important. So yeah, the looking at gaining weight and looking at the rates of gaining weight. So 
people tend to either think, okay, I need to dirty bulk and just eat everything and I'll get jacked sometime and then I'll just do a super intense cut and it'll be good. Yes. <laughs> or people are just like, no, super slow, lean bulking. That's yeah. the way. And yeah. It seems to be like different camps for different ways and like, we don't really have like much evidence to back that up mm. or either, either way. So we're just really curious to see if a larger surplus of calories versus a smaller for surplus to calories versus like, does that make a difference in terms of body composition changes so does one group gain more muscle does one gain more fat are they the same and then also comparing it to just maintenance so like a control group seeing like what the difference is from saying the same right um, so yeah. we're trying to say because people say like yeah do do a dirty bulk um because you but you'll gain a lot of muscle and you'll gain quite a bit of fat too but the, the muscle is the important part mm. or if you do the lean bulk like minimize the fat gain and still get the, the muscle gain but maybe you know maybe you're missing out on maximizing muscle gain because you're not fully in a bigger surplus we right. don't really know but again yeah. reason why we're trying to, to yeah. look at that so maintenance group five percent calorie surplus and a 15 percent calorie surplus group mm -hmm. and then eight weeks total of training the training is going to be the same between everyone just so we're seeing that and the way the training set up is essentially so we, we, we also are looking at well-trained individuals or like moderately trained individuals mm. so they need to be able to squat so for males squat one and a half times body weight and to be able to at least squat their body weight uh, to bench their body weight sorry mm -hmm. and then for females 1.25 times body weight for a squat and 0.75 times body weight for bench okay cool. um, so we're yeah. looking at some people who have some some at least experience training yeah, and for, for sure. training for at least two years for a minimum of like three times a week so so right. not novice individuals not elite athletes but mm -hmm. kind of somewhere in the middle yeah. so we, we're trying to see because again there's not much research in that population either mm. there's a lot in novice people but we can't really take that information and translate it to people who already been lifting because it's completely different because for a novice just about anything works but for those who have been in the game for a bit we need to know like what actually is the maybe the better way to go or yeah. a way that can maximize one training outcome more so than another um, so another reason why this study is really cool and really important because we're looking at those that population. Yeah, yeah. I mean it was, it's it's obviously harder to get those yes. participants right, and yeah, so do you think that's why there's so much more study on on the the novice individual? Yeah, no, for sure. Because when when we start putting these stipulations, like you need to be able to do this to do that, uh, we're controlling your whole training. You can't do <laughs> yeah. you can't do the things that you like to do. That's the biggest thing. People don't like when you control their training. Yeah, I um, mean that was a turn off for me when I read yeah. it. I was like, wait. Wait, I can't do anything outside of these three sessions a week. Wait, I can't even like, I can't go for a run or I can't like do handstands in the backyard or like anything that's going to cause yeah. like a large amount of stimulus mm -hmm. to the body. I was like, do I really want to give that up for like eight weeks? And I just come off doing yeah. six days a week of training. So mm -hmm. that was like a massive shift. But you got to train biceps three times a week. That's <laughs> well, yes. And, and I guess we'll get into like the actual methods of it yeah, because yeah. as I found out, it was actually like a, such... I'm just so glad I did it because it was a welcome change yeah. and the the response I saw was um, quite enlightening to me. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, should we run through that? Like, how did, yeah. how how was it all structured and, like, how do we put it together? Yeah, yeah. So, real quick, like, the point that you said before and you mentioned again now is, like, you didn't know what research was, but you got interested in it and you tried it and you were glad you did it. Mm -hmm. So, that's the biggest thing is that we're, we're trying to get more people realizing that research it's fun mm -hmm. you know, as a participant too yeah. and you can learn a lot from it so and like basically like our, our sessions we're just showing up and training yeah throw on some throw on some music yeah here like don't even worry about i'm loading your plates for you i am yeah. you what to do just go in there and put in the work so we're taking out that that mental ability like oh what should i do for day for training how hard should it be like that's that's on me i i, I yeah. take care of that you just show up and put in the work that was the dream so it's, yeah yeah exactly so it, it is a really cool experience um i think a lot more people should you know try to get involved because they don't realize maybe they're scared at first but yeah um, it, for sure it's really, yeah it's it's a little yeah. bit intimidating like yeah. i'm gonna go be a part of a study and you know all this sort of stuff but i think like yeah i i looked at it as like it's it's literally you're having a personal trainer for like eight weeks and and a nutritionist yeah and yeah, yeah and you, yeah. you and we're working with a dietitian so it's like uh, and i wasn't used to you know, obviously I, I train people in person, but I'm not used to being on the other side of that mm -hmm. where like you're loading the plates yeah. and I'm like sitting there and I'm, and I don't, and I'm, as I'm driving out to see you, I don't even have to think at all about what the training session is, what it's going to compose of, which is usually like kind of that mindset I get into like with my ritual with training is like to sit down and go, Hey, what is my session today? Yeah. You know, what are my plans to do? How am I going to execute that? But with that, it was like, I'm just going to drive over, listen to a podcast, enjoy the road trip. And, and then I turn up and just do whatever you say to do. Yep. Um, and it was just so enjoyable and such almost a stress relief for me. Yeah. So it was good, man. Yeah. So, so basically, like I said, eight weeks of training. Um, but before you actually get into the training, 
Uh, you're going to get on, get on a Skype call with Steve Taylor, uh, the RD of 3DMJ, if you're not familiar with. He's phenomenal. Such a good dude. I should get Steve on. Yeah, yeah, you should. Um, so basically, get a call with him, and you have to find your maintenance calorie intake. Uh, and to do that, you basically will track on MyFitnessPal, uh, or FitGenie if you use that. And for two weeks, so from week to week, two different weeks, you need to have, be able to hit maintain the same body weight within a certain percentage to be considered that maintenance. Because we need to find your actual maintenance calorie intake so that we can then make the appropriate jumps or maybe stay the same if you're in the maintenance group. Mm -hmm. um, so you do that. So you're having these calls with him. Um, and if, you can be brand new to tracking and that's okay. And like, we'll just kind of teach you how to do that. So it's like, cool, this is what it's like. This is what to expect. And then after the first week, do a video, send it to him. Hey, Steve, like this is what happened. Um, first week, it went like this. You, and he, you put all of your info on the Excel sheet. So he has access to that too, of as in like what your food intake is like. So macros, so, so protein, carbs, fats, total calories. Uh, and then in that video, you can explain anything else that you feel like is important for him to know. Uh, and then once we find your maintenance, you still will do a weekly kind of, kind of video with him to say, hey, this week was a great week. I hit all my macros. I'm feeling good. Training feels good. Or today, this week sucks. I went off my nutrition on Monday, but I got back on Tuesday. And, and he'll give you guidance on like, cool, like don't worry about it do this change if you need to don't do this change and it's kind of again having that guidance from a, a proper mm, person who knows mm. it and then the nutrition side yeah uh, and then from the training side you'll come in we'll do some one rams in the squat and the bench press so to find your baseline there too um, which are fun because sometimes people don't know how to truly do a uh, one repetition max and yeah, to see their max true. strength so having people who do it for their like i've been doing one rm tests for my whole life like that's what i do yeah, yeah for sure <laughs> you know, so, and taking people through it properly uh, which is difficult to do yeah and me and the team will will do that get your true one rms and then we use that to help kind of project your training for the next eight weeks um and then the training itself so it's three times a week and you're squatting and benching three times a week, which is also kind of new for some people. Yeah, like, totally. Oh, that, that sounds scary. Is that too much? Yeah, yeah. The way it's set up is it's not too much. You know, it's, it's like daily undulating periodization. So, uh, for example, maybe on week one, it'll be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and it'll be tens on Monday, eights on Wednesday, and fives on Friday, or sixes on Friday, with just a little bit higher intensity as the week goes on. Right. Um, so, it's like it's structured so that it's doable. It's not too much. And then over the eight weeks, intensity will get higher and volume will start to drop. Um, but not too much, uh, which is a which is a point that I remember you talked about. And it's like we're getting we're getting. So the goal is to the main goal of the study, of course, is body composition. But we're also looking at strength in addition to it. But mm. to make a program that can do both can sometimes be a little tough. Yeah. Um, so that, that was one of the things that we were we tried to just to find a nice balance with. So it's like getting used to heavier loads. So intensity is high, um, but also looking at body composition outcomes. So we're also trying to get volume pretty high at some point. Too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Do you think you needed to test absolute strength within the study? If Do it's just, to? yeah, because if it's just a weight gain study and we're trying to extrapolate, hey, how much muscle mass and it, like how, what's the ratio between muscle mass to fat mass that someone gains between these different groups of weight gain? Mm -hmm. Did we need to test strength? need not necessarily but yes at the same time so so in the beginning we do because we need to find percentage uh so we do use course. so we use your one rm uh to to use it to have percentages to start off with training so the mm. sort of squat benches we usually start off using percentage base but then the load for the weeks afterwards are pretty much dictated by rpe um so so we do have the one rm test for that specifically and then it's like for doing a pre we do a post too and it's having a strength assessment mm. is also another factor to look at so maybe you know maybe we see larger strength gains in one group versus the other so it's just in addition to it but like you said it, it might not be the best setup for in terms of of just strictly body composition yeah yeah because yeah. the training like you said had like gets like we're doing fours on bench and squat in, in the last week at eight to like zero to two reps in reserve which ne isn't necessarily hypertrophy-esque yes yeah, yes yeah. so because yeah. we, we're trying to get you used to and ready for a one rm test exactly but while not doing singles and doubles which is typically what you would do but also for while sure. still trying to keep it volume based so yeah yeah which is why we have the accessories too yeah i guess a big focus with the program was trying to get a lot of volume mm -hmm. um for those muscle groups over that period of time so that we can because obviously for a certain for certain hypertrophy outcomes we need a certain amount of volume to hit like certain threshold of of sets per muscle group mm -hmm. per week type thing right so we had that squat bench um three days a week mm -hmm. with undulating sets well I, sorry undulating reps throughout those days yeah. and then we did also did accessories within that same session um so do you want to describe how we do the accessories for mm -hmm. for the study and then maybe like if that would be appropriate for someone to do within a normal training session yeah. on their own 
Because, yeah. I mean, for me, it was like I very rarely train unless we're doing like one of our small group lift club sessions. We sometimes do training like that for the accessories because mm-hmm. it's quick and we get it done faster and it's kind of fun. Yeah. So it was actually fun to me to come and do that um, and just go really hard and then it's done and I'm, I'm out of the gym. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we're going to run through that, man. Yeah, yeah. So for the accessories, so like you said, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, for example, if you're doing it, it'd be squat and bench. And then for the accessories... Um, on Monday and Friday or day one and day three, they would be the same movements. So it'd be a lat pull down, an overhead press dumbbell seated, uh, and then a barbell curl. And then on the second day, it would be a dumbbell row, a lateral raise, and a hammer curl. And so with that, so the Monday and Friday, the, the, the exercises were the same, but the rep ranges were different. So on the first day, is typically a higher rep range, and the second day is typically a lower one. So for example, on the week one, it'd be like a 10 to 15 on Monday, and a Friday, it'd be a 8 to 12. And then after the four-week mark, it'll decrease to 8 to 12 on the first day, and then 6 to 10 on the second day. Mm. Yes, and with those three accessory movements, um, the goal is to go to failure center, so maximum effort. And like you said, mate, <laughs> should we train like that? Like this is one of the biggest topics we all have. Like, should we train to failure? What's yes. better? What's yeah. not? And it's like, when it comes to science, sometimes we need to keep in mind that we're trying to answer a question. And sometimes the way the science is set up isn't necessarily how your training should be set up. Mm-hmm. So the reason why we're training to failure during those accessory movements is that we need to keep intensity equal across individuals so for example if you're doing the study like you did um say we have just an eight rpe was our target so like two reps in reserve and we tell everyone to do that you might be able to get an eight rpe but for me maybe i am bad at using that and i only do i'm at like a six rep rpe so it's only four reps in reserve so technically like total intensity over the long term won't be equated but having everyone go to failure uh, for those movements we can say that intensity was equal between participants for those movements yeah if you have if you have someone like yourself standing there going you're going to train to failure on the set and i'm going to tell you when to stop like you're going to keep going until you just like it's easy to see what failure is because the bar no longer moves no matter how hard you try to push or pull it um but if you know within if someone's training on their own what they perceive failure to be may be very different to what like we see in like what is true failure in the research Mm -hmm. right so there's like this level of intensity that you have to train to which is like really freaking hard like it's like i think what a lot of people think failure is in the gym is not really true failure Mm -hmm. um so potentially what people think maybe two reps in reserve or three reps in reserve is is maybe more like four or five reps in reserve Mm -hmm. because it's still really hard training but like failure is just this whole other world of like um as like (laughs) as like mike is a tell describes like a religious experience like you're like (laughs) like and i found it so difficult on those accessories because you're doing them you say we're doing the lat pull down then the shoulder press and then the bicep curl zero rest in between all three of those it was like go 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 and they were all complete failure so i was completely gassed like cardiovascularly i was puffing and everything was aching my forearms were a mess and i was all jacked up and then it's like hey we're gonna go again it was like a two minute rest period which seemed to go in like a 30 second it was just gone and and it was three sets of that back to back and as we saw when we trained to failure in that first set, cool, good, good, um, good number of reps in that set. Second set, they naturally dropped down because we're hitting failure and not taking like a huge amount of rest. So the reps that I can now complete is is reduced, and the same with the third set. But all of them are my maximum yeah. effort, and so that's equal across the board with all participants. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, yeah, if I went in there and did a failure set, and then you went in there and did, um two reps in reserve but that could very well have been three reps in reserve or four reps in reserve like based off your subjective like um well yeah how you how you assessed it yeah. personally right yeah and, and and like you said so there's two two points that i want to bring that you mentioned so the like you said being in the lab and having someone there as, as me as like a research assistant and pushing to true failure is a really good experience and like you said something that we don't yeah. always see uh, and I'm not saying you need to be in the lab to experience that. No. You know what I mean? It's more so of having someone there to hold you accountable, whether that be a trainer, uh, a friend that you trust, uh, someone, just anyone that can actually be able to truly hold you accountable. And that's just very beneficial. And like I said, you can get that experience through participating in research, which is which is cool. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. And then the second one is like, like you said, we did back to back to back. So it was basically a, no rest in between the accessories. And do we train like that all the time? Yeah, no, not necessarily. But another another thing when it comes to research is 
try because we like I said we struggle to get participants because we're already asking so much from them um, so we try not to ask too much in terms of their time commitment as well so if we're supersetting these exercises again that kind of minimizes the the time commitment right because mm -hmm. we were getting training sessions done in like an hour mm -hmm. so we're doing three sets of squat and bench and three sets of accessories of three movements and within an hour plus or minus mm -hmm. 10 minutes mm -hmm. and while still talking in between mm -hmm. and still having a good time yeah and it's totally like, that's 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 it's going to be tough to do, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, but again, an hour for three days a week isn't super time yeah, consuming for someone. Sure. Um, which, totally. which, which from that alone, we can take so much, you know, practical applications from. Yes, you can train in an hour. That's okay. You just need to put in the work and you can manipulate a couple of the training variables, whether it be rest periods, um, supersetting things. So the, these strategies can work. Um, but again, you don't always have to do these things. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it shows, I guess, you know, you can see in the responses you get from the participants is that you can train three days a week with a short session that doesn't include like a ton of volume in reality and see great response from it. But probably like, I guess, I guess one of the themes that I use with my clients is like the less often they train and the less time they have to train, probably the harder we have to train within those exactly. sessions. Yeah. So like the, the volume that they're completing needs to be at a, like a really high, like relative intensity, like how hard they're training. So that, that hitting failure kind of helps in that situation. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so I think I, I think it was it was a cool way to to run through it. Um, definitely definitely something like really challenging though. Mm -hmm. Like I I was surprised at how challenging it was in comparison to what I thought it was gonna be. Yeah. So ah, three days a week, I can smash that. There's Is nothing. That gonna be enough. Only three days. <laughs> yeah. And at the end, you're like, only three days. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a lot. It's like only yeah. three days rest at first. Ah, it's fine. Then yeah. Yeah, and I think like for me, I, it really helped psychologically to have all those days where I wasn't, it was four days a week not training. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what am I going to do with myself? Like, I can't even do any other kind of activity. I'm going to, like, I've walked trooper heaps, obviously, but, which is sweet. And then I started to do some yoga on those off days, mm -hmm. which was like a cool thing for me to do for recovery and mindfulness and stuff like that. But um, it was actually like, uh, yeah, it was quite enlightening to see, okay, I can train really hard three days, get a really good response. And I was seeing my strength progress over that time. Um, and not have to like freak out about like oh i'm not training this like optimal five days a week or six days a week like all these programs are telling me to do i think if people train with the right intensity and the right amount of intention and, and effort within what they do um they don't have to train nearly as much as they probably think they do yeah but i think probably the majority of people that do go to like the average gym are training with a level of intensity that's just not quite adequate mm -hmm. so they end up being like training four or five six days a week with like sub maximal sessions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um so I guess what would be your recommendation for for people like if they are looking at implementing like failure training or like reps and reserve training, um, should they be taking those accessories to failure like we were doing? Mm -hmm. Or should they be buttoning off a little bit and having like some kind of some kind of target there they're trying to hit? Yeah. Um because obviously on those barbell lifts we didn't go to failure. Yeah. So like, why do we choose to do that on the barbell list and not on the accessories? Yeah, yeah. So, so like you said, in the barbell lifts, we weren't at failure. Like that was never really the goal. So the last two weeks, intensity was higher. Whereas in like we could be, so we had ranges too, which is another benefit of being like, here's some flexibility, but as long as within you're in these ranges of reps and reserve, you're within the intensity needed to have that desired outcome. Mm. So you technically could have been to like, zero reps and reserves so we could have hit a set of failure on squat and bench we didn't always i think maybe once we did and, but like you never actually failed the rep you completed mm -hmm. all the reps um and the reason why on those big barbell movements why we do that is that if you do take those sets to failure especially more than one that's going to take more time to recover between sessions mm -hmm. so especially if you're training and say two days in a row like that's you're, you're it's unlikely that you'll come in that second session still feeling fresh um, so, so certain movements, one in terms of recovery, two in terms of safety, taking a barbell squat to failure is, uh, can be, can be really tough, <laughs> true failure. Too, yeah. By the way. yeah. It's like, it, it's scary both physically and mentally mm. you know, to, to do that. So we don't always want to do that to put participants and just people in general at risk for, for injury. Yeah. Um, so injury recovery and, uh, just that mental ability too to like make sure like it's, it's okay. Like squats can be very, squats seem to be the one that people struggle with the most in terms of just like doing because yeah. it's it's such a physical and mental feat for people to, to, yeah. to come across you yeah I mean? like the bars on your back you get pinned you're screwed that's what people think and it's like regardless of how much weight's on there it's like that constant feeling that it's there so another reason why you know coming into the doing the research where you have someone there you're in a safe environment uh it 
can can say hey it's not that scary mm. it's all right and like training properly looks like this yeah um so yeah that's why in those big movements usually you're not going to failure mm. and it's not, not the recommendation but for the accessories you can uh, because basically all the reasons for the first time for the for the said why we don't on the barbell ones or why we do on the potentially for the yeah. accessory movement so there's a smaller chance of risk of injury because if you're doing bicep cable curls the only thing that's moving is your bicep mm. and there's very like other movement that's going on so there's not much of a and if you somehow fail the rep you can just lower lower it whereas yes. a squat you're like it might get pinned if the safeties are in the right spot it's difficult to get away yeah. from yeah so it's like safety isn't as big of an issue when it comes to the accessory movements um recovery again you're using smaller muscle groups so it's again just the bicep versus a squat where it's quads glutes potentially hamstrings lower back everything else your heart your mind <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's going to take a little bit more time for, yeah. for recovery so because you're using a lot more yeah um so yeah that way for accessories you can take to failure potentially you don't have to um, but you, you can, if you, you know, to, and like you said, the times to do that is dependent on how many times a week are you training? Um, what, like, are, do you have specific volume requirements? Are you supposed to be hitting X amount of sets? Um, but yeah, so I think there's time yeah. and a place for, totally. for those things, but specifically for that, so mm. it's like that. Yeah. So I guess like with this, with the study, if we like, I don't know how much we can talk about like the results of it cause it's not actually finished yet. So there's probably not, you don't have all the results yeah. in, but we can see like, or even with myself, you can see from start to finish my one rms went up substantially mm. i think predominantly because i just did those movements so regularly like it was like squat bench three days a week for three sets each that's a lot of practicing that movement mm. right so i got good at doing those movements and saw my strength go up but of course there is the the other side of like i was actually so i was in the five percent surplus group so i was actually eating more than i ever have um yeah. because i had that kind of accountability of of you know, every every end of the week, every week, going to Steve, hey, look, these are my numbers. Um, I had to hit a certain amount of numbers. And if I didn't, he's like, hey, increase. you need to hit this, right? Or yeah, <laughs> increase the, if I didn't hit a certain amount of weight gain, mm -hmm. he would increase my calories. And so at one point I was eating more than I ever have. And I'm like, this is insane. But I think I needed someone to just kind of like, like slap me around and go, hey, you need to hit these numbers yeah. Yeah. because this is, you know, you're part of the study, like, and, you know, for my own integrity's sake, I'm like, I'm going to do this thing right, you know. So mm -hmm. for me, that was really beneficial. And so a combination of me practicing those movements three days a week, the calories were sufficient mm -hmm. for once. Like usually I'm, you know, kind of under shooting. So I'm eating a lot of food um, and we're training really hard with high intensity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we saw like substantial strength gain. Like I think my bench started at 105 five or one oh two point five or something like that. Yeah. One oh two and a half. And then the la and then we benched one twelve. Twelve and a half. Yeah. yeah. Which we had to so do like twice. Eight, eight weeks, <laughs> Ten kilo jump. For start and you started yeah. at a good bench. So like a percentage increase. I'm not good at math. That's a good percentage increase. <laughs> yeah. I mean yeah, yeah, that is quite a large percentage increase. Mm -hmm. Um so and I've you're, never you're, been a good bencher. Yeah, and you're you're a trained person. It's mm. not like you're a novice where you expect Exa potential expect that. Kilos, but like to, to to go from there to there and that short of time like it's yeah cool. and if and and the same thing with the squat i think i had a 120 no one, 135 a 135 mm -hmm. and then what did i do 140 147 47 and a half yeah. and a half and i was like gotta yeah, let him get the 150 yeah, yeah. Oh, so, close. Uh, so you know and the same i mean those like my two worst lifts the squat and the bench really especially yeah. the squat like it's a it's a nightmare movement for me um so those were some massive jumps for me and like probably the biggest progression I've seen in my strength in the longest time because I actually stuck to something for eight weeks yeah. and I ate enough food. Um, and so I guess, and, and we can extrapolate that to like hypertrophy gain as well. It's like if I'm gaining substantial strength in a movement um, that is a movement that I've, I've done before and I'm semi-proficient in and it's not just gaining all these like new neuro neurological adaptations to an to a exercise, I'm actually gaining pure strength on the exercise mm -hmm. along with an increase in food and um and then we can kind of say hey look there's probably a, a, some level of muscle main gain there along with a, of course the increase in body weight on the scales so you know that one's probably an essential part so and then we also measured skin folds and ultrasound mm -hmm. at the start and end yes. and we don't have the results from that but yeah, yeah. we can kind of extrapolate hey there's like some there's some level of muscle gain as a result of the study um but we don't know what that ratio is. Yeah, yeah. So for the ultrasound, looking at muscle thickness, so again, how thick the muscle is and the changes from pre to post. And then for the skin folds, looking at body fat. So so again, they're seeing like we have strength, body fat, total weight, total body weight, um, 
muscle mass and seeing the changes from pre to post. And, and, and when the results come out in terms of extrapolating and, and the discussions, so we're seeing, like, okay, the maintenance group versus the 5% group versus the 15% group. Mm. What is the difference? Does, do, is there a, is there like, does the 15% group have a larger increase in muscle mass and body fat, whereas maybe the 5% has a similar increase in muscle mass as the 15%, but not as much body fat? Again, we don't know. We mm. don't, this kind of can just hypothesize different things. But we get to see that and, we, and what that means for us all in listening in terms of training is, okay, maybe if potentially if we're trying to maximize muscle gain, primarily just muscle gain, maybe we should be in a larger surplus because we can potentially gain more muscle if we're in a 15 versus a 5%. So maybe going the slow route in terms of a lean bulking. Yes, we can we can keep some abs, sure. But long term, maybe we won't gain as much muscle. Mm. And as we know, gaining muscle is really tough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, especially long term, because when we talk about training, we should always kind of think long term too, in terms of like adherence, enjoying training, um, but also like making a plan that's gonna fit in line with our goals, while also being enjoyable. Mm. And, and if you like to gain muscle and want to gain muscle, know that it takes a long time. Yeah, it's not like <laughs> so these why, guys yeah. who come in and go like, hey, I've got. I've got RMV coming up and in, in you know at New Year's. Yeah. I want to gain some muscles. Like can we look a little bit further? Oh, than for that? next year's RMV. Yeah. yeah, sure. We can start yeah. now. And maybe we'll get a little bit. Maybe yeah. two kilos of muscle. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the whole uh, you know, everyone wants it now, the quick. And fixing. and especially if because again, we're looking at a, a decently trained population, we're not looking at novices, it takes even longer of time mm, to, to, that's to right. gain muscle. No, no, I'm not saying this to, to scare people, saying like, oh, gaining muscle is very tough. It is. It's just more of an honesty thing. But also yep. if you prepare yourself knowing that it takes time and acknowledging that fact then you can prepare properly you can't mm. be like oh it's been a year i'm not jacked i don't look like arnold Schwarzenegger. i should probably just quit <laughs> yes like, no arnold's been doing it for years yeah other that's right he's been doing yeah, things, yeah. <laughs> but, like, yeah, things like training it takes time and, yeah and, but um yeah so that we can find some pretty cool stuff when it comes to, to the study and, yeah. what, what do you expect to be the results i so i think in, in lines of what i kind of said a little bit earlier was that i think the you'll the fifteen percent group will maybe gain a little bit more muscle mm-hmm. than the five percent group, mm-hmm. but with an increase in body f- more more body fat than the five percent group. Yes. Um, and then the maintenance. I'm really interested about the maintenance, because especially yes. recently there was that paper uh, by Christopher Barakat that said looking at um, in terms of you know can you still build muscle but stay the same and That's body right. recomposition. Recom- because at first everyone's like, no, not possible. Now it's like maybe 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 mm-hmm. and then i think with this maintenance group we can potentially add to that discussion a bit too because right, if the maintenance group they stay the same weight but maybe they get stronger but maybe maybe they gain muscle lose fat keep fat we don't really know but yeah. we can we might be able to see a little bit of that with this maintenance group awesome. so that'd be interesting too um because it's kind of it's kind of hard for them not to do something you know what i mean Especially, they're training yeah the same training you did yeah uh, but and, maybe not as much calories and they're trained individuals like we've said yeah. multiple times so it's like they're not like we know that someone who is new to training is able to body recomp mm-hmm. like easy as like they can just start training hard and stay the same body weight and the body will change the look mm-hmm. like and you see those before and afters all the time on instagram like i'm the same weight as i was four years ago but i look completely different it's like yeah that's that's body recomp that's like yeah. yeah and and so but it's when you look at like someone who's been training consistently with some sort of like smart programming, mm-hmm. then it's like, hey, can we still body recomp? Can we yeah. still gain muscle and potentially lose body fat or, you know? And, and even if we can, is that the best option for that person? Yeah, you know for I mean? sure. Like, like for, so because like I said, maybe you're missing out on, on gaining as mm-hmm. more muscle. And if the goal is to gain muscle long term, like, yeah, maybe you'll be 10 kilos heavier for a year or two. But like when you decide to get leaner, the muscle is going to be there. Yeah. It's like, it's like gaining muscle is hard. I'm just going to keep saying it yeah. it's, it's true. But, and everyone wants to look good and lean, uh. but you can't really have the muscle showing if it's not there to begin with when you get lean. You're just going to get lean and you're just going to look skinny. Yes. 100%. <laughs> Which if that's your goal, that's okay. Yeah. But if you want to also have muscle, then it takes a lot more time. Than that. Yeah. And taking time to be maybe a little bit more uncomfortable than normal and not having mm. like, you won't have a six pack, sorry for maybe like a year. But when you decide to get leaner again, you'll have a six pack and you'll have muscles too totally so it's like but but that is a huge mental investment and sometimes people struggle with that yes again maybe like that's why research can help us out and that's why people like you like eric people who are, are getting this content out there for people to listen to and making it easy to understand mm. people that's super important to do you know saying hey it's okay to gain weight that like you should gain weight or it's it's it'll be fine or trust me or have someone you can trust for that process to put you on the right path and yeah be like hey coach i trust you i i'm a little bit like i, I i'm I have some more body fat than normal, but I feel really good. Uh, and you say that when I get there, when I get leaner and the muscle will be there, I'm trusting you. Mm-hmm. And then typically it, it works. Yeah. yeah. 
Totally, totally. So you expect the the fifteen percent surplus to gain more muscle mass than the the five percent surplus, but the five percent surplus gain a little bit less body fat yeah. than the fifteen percent. Mm-hmm. I guess the 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 issue there is that I guess it's that ratio right of muscle mass to fat mass gain, mm-hmm. and that potentially, and this is I guess the issue I have with like say the 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 dirty box, the gym box, where it's just like, let's get really, really freaking heavy yeah. to gain muscle mass. And it's like, yes, that's fantastic. You will gain a larger amount of muscle mass than someone who's doing a slow gaining phase. But you you still you still want to have a decent body composition long term, I'm assuming. So you're going to have to diet down. Mm-hmm. And at some point, you're going to have to do a very long diet to get off all that extra body fat. Yeah. So I guess the, therein lies the question of like, what, what might be the more optimal to bulk really hard, gain a lot of muscle mass and then cut really hard and take a long time doing that. Or you go like the, still in a surplus, you're gaining substantial muscle, but you're gaining less fat than the 15% surplus. And then you don't have to spend so long cutting down. Mm -hmm. What do you think would, do you think that's a, a, an appropriate assessment of what will happen? And, and, and do you think there's a a better way like either or? Yeah, I I think it's a a really good point Um, in terms of, I think, yeah, so definitely as with all things, you really must consider the individual in terms of what are their goals, how comfortable are they with certain things. So again, some people might not be comfortable with putting on more more body fat. Some people might be like, if it means I can look better and they have more muscle long term, sure, I'll do it. But you really need to know what is okay for that individual before even making those decisions. You know, they have these questions, have those discussions, what they're comfortable with. Do you, are you comfortable tracking your food? Some people might not even be comfortable doing that or it might be difficult for them or it might be unhealthy for them in some way so asking those appropriate questions to know where they're at then can help guide that decision later on of like what should we do Um, because everyone wants to know what should we do right away what's the best way what's this it's not always that easy you know taking that time to get the crucial information beforehand so that you can make those appropriate uh, decisions you should do first but if you ask those questions and then you have the choice yeah, like you said, if, if, you're, if you're in the 15% group, maybe it'll take longer to, to get the weight, the, the body fat off. Mm. Um, but for some, maybe that would be okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, yeah, I guess, because if you look at the study too, it's only eight weeks, which is pretty short yes. in, in terms of thing. And like typically if you're gaining, you maybe, you, you don't want to be gaining for just eight weeks. Like, because long-term, you, you probably want to be gaining longer because if you're, especially if your goal is to build muscle, you typically should be spending more time in the gaining phase than you should in a dieting phase. Regardless, like people always want to look lean, but again, long term muscle gain hard. Um, so, so maybe just and that might mean it's not feasible to be in a fifteen percent surplus for you know more than eight weeks. Because again, we did those to like ask the question to answer the question. Um, so maybe like it doesn't have to be fifteen percent, uh, and it doesn't have to be the rate of weight gain that we saw in the study. Because again, like if you didn't hit that, if you weren't gaining say 0. 0.4, 400 grams each week, if you weren't doing that, increased calories. Mm-hmm. Most people maybe not won't do that in terms of their regular training. Right. Uh, it might be like okay, two weeks, three weeks, and I'm still not gaining. And maybe I'll do a small. Maybe I'll do, yeah. Yeah. And again, that's like three weeks, but that's half the study almost. That's you know right. I mean? so, yeah. So I think that's something to consider too is the the time. So longer time scale. Yeah. 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 So like in that longer time, maybe it like. Maybe a ten percent might be a good middle ground between yes, you're maximizing muscle gain and sort of minimizing uh, uh, fat gain, but also you're you know psychologically okay and mm. you know like you're planning out the next two years where it's like okay for twenty four months, sixteen of those I'm spending gaining and eight of those I'm spending dieting. Yeah, kind of thing. So it's yeah. like having that some ratio or some guideline and knowing like if you have a competition or some day, like a wedding date or some day, you just feel like, or even just setting a date in general can be helpful for, you know, achieving those goals and then working backwards mm-hmm. can be helpful for yeah, planning for sure. that out. Yeah. yeah, I guess a huge part of it is like you said, it's the individual and it's, and, and for me, like we're talking about on the way over here is that it's the accountability of making sure I am gaining, right? Yeah. And so if I've got someone going, hey, look, you're not gaining this week, we need to make a jump. Great, because then I'm going to actually make that jump and commit yeah. to it. But if I'm just looking at the scales and I'm just going, yeah, I'm kind of in a gaining phase. Like I'm like, I'm gaining this amount per week, but really like over, and this is what happened when I checked in with Steve for the first initial checking of my body weight and everything. I was like, yeah, I've been in this gaining phase for like the last like nine months or whatever. And he's like, oh yeah, send me through like your, your like last 90 days of, um, of body weight gain. And I averaged it out. It was on the happy scale app. So it averaged it out for you. And it's like 0.1 gram, a 0.1 kilo gain. And I'm like, so, and he's like, yeah, so you've been at maintenance. I was like, 
shit i've been amazed that it's like yeah, it, it yeah. didn't kind of occur to me because it's just going through the day-to-day and i'm not like looking at it from the outset which is why i coach people through it because it's like yeah. they have someone else to look at it for them and go hey this is our goal and this is what we need to stick to right mm-hmm. and and it's essential for me to do that same thing if you but i think you yeah, like you said like we're saying it's a long-term process and you do have to you do have to commit to that to that gain if you want like the best results possible um i guess like even for you if you want to go even like put it into like your personal life how do you actually approach your gaining now in yeah. terms of like because you're seeing these different people go through this mm-hmm. and you're gaining at the moment right yeah the eternal gain <laughs> yeah so yeah. so McDonald's before we came that's right Burger King, <laughs> second, Bur- uh, yeah, yeah Burger King on the way out so how do you oh, I need to have a food right now hold on give me a second yes <laughs> so how are you yeah how are you implementing it yourself yeah yeah so like just real quick a point that you said that mm-hmm. I really liked um, is that you went through it and you had you were held accountable and which is really cool is you as a coach yourself and as a, someone who gets information out there too creates a content for it and you're still doing this learning and able to able mm. to do that so that's really important because like you said now you will likely be a better coach and you understand things a little bit more um so having have to be, having to be able to do that is is, is important because like you said we don't really know it till we till we go through it we have that experience so that's that's really cool mm. um for my own stuff yeah uh, and then like so i always think you know that you hear the thing it's like a doctor is the worst patient it's the same thing when it so comes true. to training. It's like yeah. you tell me, oh, you should do the training should be like this, nutrition should be like this, and then you're just eating <laughs> McDonald's as you're telling them to do this. And it's like, oh yeah, what about you? Ah, yeah, I, I know, but don't but, worry about me. But, just, yeah, just, just worry about you. Listen, listen, I'm the coach. <laughs> you're uh, McFlurry. Uh, you're the, <laughs> so it can be hard, but that's one reason why I love to coach myself. So mm-hmm. in terms of my own training nutrition, I've always been in control of that, and mm-hmm. I love that because I also like to experiment with a lot of things um, so that I also could be a better coach and information provider. It's mm-hmm. like, hey, I went through all this stuff when I was younger. Like, I did keto. I hated it. I did this. I hated it. I did this. It worked kind of well, but I hated it. And, you know, it yeah. didn't work well. So just getting that experience. So for me, it's like, let's try to, what does it feel like to do 25 sets per, per, for, volume for each muscle group let's try it out to see mm-hmm. if that's feasible for someone yeah so experimenting with that's things. cool yeah yeah and and it's cool because i get better and better in terms of learning and my own training nutrition each year which is which is really cool because i just like really enjoy that that process um mm-hmm. so for my own training nutrition right now it's been the plan right now 2023 eric helms v coley souza versus Yo. a bunch of other people because we're supposed to <laughs> bodybuilding competition um it, it, it started off as a joke and back in 2018 when like he was there and then we were all motivated to train because he was there then he left and it's like oh he's not here anymore. He's not here. <laughs> and then we're like hey we're gonna compete against some bodybuilding it's like yeah 2023 we'll do it yeah and then everyone else bailed out and then i'm still here like you're still there i'm, I'm doing it i Let's told go. him I was doing it, and i've been talking a lot of smack to him too it's like I have to <laughs> yes. uh, so yeah but I, I i've always loved bodybuilding and gaining muscle so it's like something i've wanted to really invest my time in and especially now it's like i really like to see how it is to step on stage mm-hmm. um so with that in mind it's like i need to gain muscle and that's hard again i probably said it so many times but on purpose it's hard to gain muscle so it's like okay and i need to be comfortable gaining weight um, and with my background i was like hmm i've been trying to lose weight my whole life now i have to gain weight that's that sounds really scary to me yeah um so so learning like where is my term like where is comfortable for me what weight is that at and does that change from year to year so like I maybe for the past, so I've been training for four, six years now. Uh, like the first year wasn't super structured. It was just like Lane Norton fat program on bodybuilding.com yeah. and Steve Campus, big man on campus. <laughs> Steve Cook's big man on campus. Like that's the one. I'm yeah. doing it and I'm keep doing it. And it was good. It was good for. Which for is actually years. a great way to start. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. not so bad it was at like, all. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. And then and then like learning from Zordos, my own training, I just like changing things up. And then now it's like super bodybuilding focused. So it's mm-hmm. like really cool. Um, but like, I think the, one of the coolest things is so I'm being in a structured gaining phase and especially being coached by myself to do that has been really cool it's yeah. really tough yeah uh, but it's cool and it's like because and, and when things get tough it's like i'm gonna go talk to my coach so i'm like hey colby hey colby uh <laughs> how you feeling ah, you know i'm feeling a little uh, a little uncomfortable it's like yeah no, keep pushing keep pushing yeah so <laughs> but, yeah. You know, but like, to, to do that it's like i feel like i gained so much value from that it's like, okay mm. Because I, I like I, I talk to myself all the time. I like I love talking to myself. I'm Good. pretty cool, can't you tell? Good on you. Uh, no. <laughs> but it's like uh, uh, the, those skills to be able to be comfortable with yourself, and like sometimes not everyone can do that. I'm not saying everyone should do that. And you having other people there to talk to, fantastic. I, I talk to them about other stuff too. But in terms of training, it's like 
it's on me. Mm. Like I, no one else is making decisions. It's on me. So like, mm. what's the best thing for me? And I have to make that decision, not necessarily my coach. Um, so it's been really cool. Cause it's like to be in those structured gaining phases, they get easier over time is what I found. It's really cool. Right. And then knowing like for me, it's like, okay, I've got an up to 95 kilos, like three times now, which is pretty heavy for me. I'm pretty sure. And, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Oh, sometimes I didn't even realize I got to 95 kilos. I'm like wow. gaining, gaining, like yeah. step on the scale. You're like, oh, that's heavy. He's a big boy. Uh, freshman 15? Can I can I use that excuse? <laughs> uh, so it's like, no, but but each year, the 95 kilos, or at least around there, feels better and better. And okay. I feel more comfortable with it. Cool. And my body composition is different. Mm. So like I am, I have more muscle. I feel more comfortable with it because I'm not as, there's not much as body fat there. Yeah. Um, so, so it's like, if it falls in line with everything that I've been learning and going through, it's like, you know, feeling okay with being a little bit uncomfortable going through these things and then following these like the prescriptions of the data and like what the science says using those scientific principles as like the groundwork is like yes follow this and then the rest is more so consistency over time and adherence and it's like wow that stuff works you just right. need a time yeah so it's just cool to see like yeah i'm not just on podcasts or i'm not just on here just saying all this stuff and then not doing it and so i'm also doing it too and experimenting mm-hmm. with it and seeing not only with myself but with other clients it's like yeah this works so yeah that's, that's that's kind of been going on for me and then also training has been very bodybuilding focused and it's like truly seeing the difference between a bodybuilding focused training versus a strength training program has mm. been re- it's like an interesting well because you've thing. done powerlifting too right yeah yeah so it's like when i, I did i've competed in two powerlifting meets and I, I really enjoyed it at the time but i just it took like i didn't like it as much as time went on because little injuries kept nagging here and there so that was unfortunate um, but also, I was like, I spent two hours just squatting and bench pressing, and I can't do my calf raises, and I love my calf raises because yes. I have to go to class now. I was like, oh no, what do I do? Um, so skip, like, oh. skip class every time. You're gonna do your calf oh, raises. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did. That's why <laughs> X fizz B minus. That's why. No, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it was like uh, the training wasn't as enjoyable anymore for me as time went on, and I got, mm. I think I got too fixated on the number. Right. Uh, for just like the squat bench deadlift, how heavy can you lift it? One rep. Uh, and I got too fixated on that. And I'm, I'm a very competitive person. And it's like, yeah, it's not going well for me. Like, I don't want to do it if I'm not really putting up good numbers compared to other people too. And it's compared to myself. Because like, there, there was a point where like, year to year, I wasn't getting strength because like the injuries were there. So that was like frustrating for me. So I was like, well, training's supposed to be enjoyable. I'm not really enjoying it right now. Right. What did I enjoy? Bodybuilding. Bodybuilding. Give me the bodybuilding. Give me the pump. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, and now that I know more, because like when I, I started off doing bodybuilding type training, uh, but then I was like powerlifting. And now it's like, well, now I have a lot more knowledge. Let me try to do a real like bodybuilding type training program. And I was like, well, what does that look like? Do I train to failure? Do I do this? All these questions and things that we talked about here and then that we see online. It's like, let's let's see what works. So it's again, like following like, volume is important. Let's, let's, let's focus on that. But the biggest thing is with bodybuilding training is you're trying to gain muscle and you want the muscle to be, that you want to grow to be the one that's doing the work. Mm. So sometimes you know, there's different tools for the job and sometimes things don't work as best as other things can. So like a barbell back squat, I would be half to squat in like 140 for reps. And it's like, but then central fatigue is super high. Uh, My joints are just destroyed. And it's like, well, man, I'm supposed to go do these other exercises afterwards. It's like just to get quad volume technically. Right. Maybe that's not the best option. Yes. What if I think about my biomechanics, think about the way my body moves, elevate the heel super high, forward knee travel a lot more and let me just hold the 20 kilo dumbbell and really focus on the quad doing the work not other things and mm. toasts my quads feels really good gets the volume for the day and boom right it's like, okay i have to be smart yes. with my decisions yeah and people often think lifting in general but more specifically bodybuilding just lift the weight bro just get the pump yeah yeah it's like well we can be smart with it too yes intensity is important but like choosing the right exercises is also yeah. important yeah i think you i think you can really you can go way too simplistic with like hypertrophy training and mm-hmm. and be like yeah just train hard and like we yeah, can bro. bro split like whatever do more than the last time. and like and just you can hard. and you'll get you'll get results right like that'll be working but you might just be it might just be suboptimal you might you could do it a better way you could choose a better exercise that will give you more stimulus and less fatigue like you were just describing um yeah, so I think it can be I can it can be simplified, but then it also on the other end of the spectrum can be way too complex when we dive into all these different things. And, and I think like we discussed during our chats during the study was like you have like over the last year or so have been trying to implement a little bit more of a simplistic programming yes. for yourself, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So I'd actually like to sort of dive into that a little bit. But maybe before we do, is um, 
what do you think the biggest differences are between that strength and hypertrophy training? Yeah. Um, yeah. Aside from like, like we just discussed, one of those is exercise selection. Mm -hmm. So you're going to try to choose exercises that are going to be the most stimulative for the target muscle group or target muscle um, with the least amount of fatigue mm -hmm. cost of the exercise. So that's one of those like differences between strength and hypertrophy. Yeah. And then maybe the other one is like, well, during the study, we did some kind of periodized training mm -hmm. where we, we dropped load or sorry, we dropped reps over time. We increased load um, and the absolute intensity went up. Um, but for hypertrophy training, do you just see that as necessary? Yeah. So like you said, typically, so to put it like simple for strength training, intensity is, I'd say one of the more important things. Obviously everything is included, volume, intensity, it's all, but like intensity is specific to training. So you need to be close to like, closest to failure if the goal is to strength as in like a one rep max so like the intensity is super important volume is important yes in the short term maybe not as much in the long term that's another big thing that people talk about now is like should powerlifters even like worry about volume and like what does their yearly planning look like mm. and it's like should they have volume phases yes no and there's a couple of pros and cons there um so like but when it comes to bodybuilding it's like volume's more important thing intensity yes but also like in in terms of looking at reps and reserve but also like rep so repetitions used so again power thing or strength was more so like single repetitions and you technically like you don't you can technically use lower reps in a more bodybuilding focused training but that might not be again the best option because again if volume's equated sure you can do seven sets of four reps on a bicep curl you technically could <laughs> would you should you maybe not yeah <laughs> it's like i would think maybe you know, three sets of 10 is maybe a little bit better of an option. Uh, Why do you so, think that would be like for that specific example, yeah. what would be the pros of doing three sets of 10 as opposed to like seven sets of four, like yeah. on a curl? Um, <laughs> sanity. Because I think, I think, I think most like the lay person actually doesn't actually, and I never, I never understood why, in a bodybuilding program it said three sets of 10 and not three sets of 11 or like yeah. or you know there's like these arbitrary numbers we just throw around and people are just like yeah you do three sets of 10 like this is what we always do but it's like mm -hmm. what why not do seven sets of four like you just said like why wouldn't you do that yeah yeah so there's a couple different things um so like if we were using the bicep curl as an example yeah doing and if we were looking at it, we need intensity to be equal to. So say, for example, we're two reps short of failure the whole time. So we're, it's enough of a stimulus where it's going to produce some some actual stimulus for the body. Yeah. Uh, but not like too much where it's failure. It's not going to be super detrimental. So it's like right in the middle, probably like a little sweet spot. Um, so to do that, if you're doing a bicep curl, you have to be really heavy weight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's like you're curling, what, 50 kilos yeah. for four reps? Yeah. Which is tough. So again, again, maybe... The, as we get heavier with that maybe risk of injury is a little bit higher too because again right. uh risk of form being thrown out the window because like yeah. you know to do four reps two reps in reserve with 50 kilos maybe you're gonna start swinging a bit which takes That's some right. stimulus off of the bicep and starts getting the lower back for some reason like, yeah let me just get this weight up because i have to intense training yeah but I mean, again is the stimulus where you want it to be and going back to that point before too it's like maybe not mm. um or so like with the with the higher reps you you can you can kind of get that so you're still keeping the intention on the bicep doing the work uh, and also it's going to be more time efficient mm. in a way because if, if you think about seven sets of four and maybe you're resting two minutes between or a minute probably two minutes you need to uh, yeah and say or 90 seconds or whatever like that's going to take you're going to be resting for like seven eight 14 minutes or whatever it is just just in between that alone and it's like if you have an hour in the gym there's one fourth of your workout for biceps question mark mm -hmm. with lower back yeah yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> biceps and lower back yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's like maybe that's not the, the smartest option so like when it comes to bodybuilding or muscle hypertrophy it's like cool what's let me make sure i'm getting the volume that i need to in, mm -hmm. uh, in an efficient way and typically it's like this is like the range but it's like six to 20 reps is mm -hmm. usually a good a good range for that and then like in that middle is where you see like eight to 12 or 10 plus or 10 to 14 some, yep. something along there or 12 even so it's like that allows you to get the volume needed um, with maybe just three or four sets as opposed to getting more sets mm. um, and it's yeah and then as you're doing more reps people, there's like speculation in terms of like muscle fiber recruitment so like are you recruiting all the muscle fibers um, type one versus type two and then all and then does that actually make a difference for for the muscle gain and should you be recruiting this and when it comes to it, it's like yes but also having a variety of rep ranges is good too so sometimes we're just like okay cool for 
bicep cable curls, eight to 12 reps, but triceps were maybe 14 to 16 rep range, um, which is why having rep ranges is also beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to my style hypertrophy, the higher rep range is typically more of a smarter option than mm -hmm. it is for strength. And it's more specific because too, when it comes to like train program, making a program specificity is always key. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, well, if I'm trying to get stronger, I need to be specific to strength, which is typically that one to five rep range that we see. That's right. Yeah. yeah so specifically comes into it. And then, um, I guess with hypertrophy training, that you, like you're saying, the goal is to get one muscle to grow bigger, right? So we have to provide attention stimulus to that particular muscle. Mm -hmm. And we want it, that to somewhat increase over time. <clears throat> so it doesn't have to be probably as complex as, say, a powerlifting program that's that's periodized towards a meet yeah. where you're going to do a one rep max attempt. It's like I could do my three sets of 10 for the whole entire year and what well, might and, and have a rip range and maybe periodize that a little bit um but just continuously providing that stimulus and training within a threshold of intensity mm -hmm. and i'll see response there like if my other factors are in place if we look at you know sleep and and calories and things like that um but yeah would you i guess would you ever throw in some kind of periodization like we did in the study in terms of actually dropping um, reps throughout a program like kind of that linear periodization or do you think there's a benefit there for hypertrophy or do you think um, and probably more towards the way you're training now do you think it's more just hey let's let's keep it more a little bit more simple simple for hypertrophy training yeah. and maybe go back to like the the bodybuilding bros kind of training where you're just going to go in there and train to a certain level of intensity and not worry too much about putting all these crazy like methods of of um, progression mm -hmm. in place yeah yeah it's, it's really interesting question and like we're slowly starting to get some more data out there but mm. not much mm. um but so like if you look at a typical say like a yearly plan for a power lifter and say you're competing at the end of the year it's like volume is going to be high to start and then intensity is going to be low but as the years get as you get closer to your meet volume is going to drop intensity is going to get higher specificity yep um whereas bodybuilding like you said or, or muscle hypertrophy if you're trying to that's your goal your goal like we want to get volume so like should we just keep volume high the whole time maybe uh, it's like, we don't know for sure, but like the way I like to look at it is I think there's utilization for both, like dipping into both realms for both sides. Mm. So if we're talking about strength, um, to be in the strength program for a long time is very difficult. Mm. Now it's on, on total body stress, joint stress, mental stress. It's hard to lift heavy for so long. So giving your body a break uh, and going to some higher volume stuff and potentially maybe even switching up those exercises because it's doing a low bar squat, you know, close to a meet because that's what powerlifters typically do or a sumo deadlift. Um, that can, that likely puts more stress on other joints because uh, you can lift, typically you can lift more in a low bar squat. So people will do that, but then your elbows start mm. to get beat up, wrists yep. start to get beat up, maybe lower back a little bit more. Um, so doing that long, like doing that for so long might not be as beneficial for your joints and then yourself so you know switching it up and doing some high bar squats and in a volume phase just for more reps seems to be like a smarter option mm -hmm. and then when it comes to the hypertrophy side i don't think it matters as much uh because like so i think we should spend more time in higher volume phases but i do think it's beneficial to have a couple of lower volume and a little bit higher strength phases but that, that i'm not saying do one rep maxes it might mean like okay instead of your eight to twelve rep range maybe you're in a, a six to eight rep range mm -hmm. or a five to eight or four to eight even I don't think you need to get as low as one, but mm -hmm. like that might be beneficial for a couple of reasons. Um, one, just making training interesting because maybe doing eight to 12 reps for a year straight <laughs> yeah. might be boring for some people. Some people might love it and that's great. Yeah. Um, but keeping it interesting, I think it's important too. Two, I think a stronger muscle, it, you're, you're more likely potentially just to recruit fibers mm. that way. So if, like, if you're stronger overall and you're using more weight for that exercise, technically you might be recruiting more fibers as time goes on. So it's like, okay, I was using 50 kilos for my row, for example, and I was doing that for eight to 12 reps. I go into a strength phase and then I'm at 60 now. And it's like, well, let me start maybe at 57 and a half for my lower rep range, so eights. And like, oh yeah, I'm stronger now so I can lift more. So over time I'm lifting more. So my volume technique is increasing. If that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm, of like mm -hmm. technically you're getting stronger. So lifting more and like you're able to lift more over time. So I think there can be some use there. Again, I don't think there's that much data really looking at that. But if you if you think about it in that way, it could have some use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So I guess um, we can sort of cover it now. Is how do you how do you program it for yourself now? Mm -hmm. um, I think I like you have been doing a lot more of the full body type training mm -hmm. in the last couple of years, and found I really enjoy it, and I I find it a really good way to structure my training throughout the week and. 
and be able to get all the volume I need to, but also enjoy my sessions more Mm -hmm. um, rather than doing, say, like a split, like a push pull legs or an upper lower, upper lower, or, you know, a a bro split where I'm just doing chest on Monday and then back and then legs and stuff like that. So uh, I think, I think it takes a lot more planning and a lot more, yeah, a lot more, I guess, know how, because you have to be a little more intricate of how you actually um, put exercises in order within a session, but then within a week as well. It's like how you, where you put your exercises, like putting, putting squats on Monday and then doing a leg press on Tuesday might not yeah. be the best idea. It's like, how are you going to, how are you going to sort of periodize your exercise selection throughout the week? Um, and, and you, you know, picking exercises that aren't going to create a huge amount of fatigue in certain areas as well. So like if I do, um, say I do a barbell RDL on a Monday and then I've got like a bent over a row on a Tuesday, it's probably not the best idea because my lower back is going to get some kind of stimulation from my RDL and then I'm going to go and try and do a bent over a row where my lower back is trying to hold me in that position or my my, my erectors. Um, you know, so there's all those intricate details yeah. that if you just like, oh, I train full body every day, I just do random things, it's not going to be a great effective yeah. program. Um but yeah, I mean, are you doing full body at the moment and yeah. why you choose to go that way? Um, and uh, yeah, let, let listeners know how you sort of go yeah, about yeah, programming so your own stuff. I've been doing the full body training for a long time. Now. You're an OG full body, bro. <laughs> Before it was cool. Before it was on YouTube. I'm <laughs> a full body. Because when, when I first learned about programming from my friend, Evan Chafee, who's phenomenal, he like, the way he structured it, it made so much sense to me. It was, it was, a, it was more so powerlifting based, but in terms of like accessories also, it, it made sense. So it was like, Cool Monday, your squat, bench, and then we'll do some type of row. Some, so it's basically with the muscle and strength pyramids kind of stuff. Yeah. It's like having a little bit of all that. Like follow these, pick these movements and, and have it there. But to have it full body allows you to really just be intentful for those movements. Mm-hmm. So like, for example, and I always like to put the more difficult stuff first. So first on each day is always a lower body movement because typically the lower body movements are going to be more taxing. Yes. Um, so maybe I'm doing a quad movement. So I'm doing a quad focused lunge or something. I'm doing that first. In my head, I know, okay, I have four or maybe five sets of this, but that's my only quad exercise for that day. So I need to make sure that my RER, RPE is accurate. So I'm hitting maybe two reps in reserve, but it's true two reps in reserve because I, and we're doing that for all sets. And if that means I'm dropping weight, that's okay. I need to be in that intensity range and within this rep range. So having those ranges again is being beneficial. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'm starting at the lower rep range and increasing as I go or whatever it is. I have some flexibility and I'm still going to get a good stimulus. It's not like needs to be 10 reps, needs to be 8.5 RPE. Because that's, yes. that's not maybe that feasible. Right. Um, so, so knowing that I just have four or five sets and I have to give it my all and I don't have to do more quad stuff afterwards is is good for me because like if i'm doing a a leg day for example it's like okay i got a squat then i got a leg press and then i got a rdl and then leg extension it's like by the time i get the leg extensions i'm usually pretty fried that's right i'm not saying that it's always that way and it can't be structured that way but typically it's going to be tough to to give the full intent towards the end of Mm -hmm. the program whereas if i'm full body it's like cool, cool quad exercise chest back shoulder bicep tricep and it's, it follows a similar pattern throughout the week. Maybe, maybe the day after, it's like a hamstring a chest, but a different chest. So maybe I'm like benching on Monday and doing flies on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's like a compound versus more like singlish joint, or mm-hmm. not as taxing of a movement. So structuring like that allows me to hit each muscle group roughly each day or every other day, depending on how it's set up, but still get enough volume throughout the week and not feel super beat up. Mm. You know, because again, if I have my leg down on Monday, and I'm training hard enough, I need to get my volume, I need to get, say, let's do 15 sets for quads and hamstrings, it's gonna be a really brutal session, both mm-hmm. physically and mentally. So then coming into, so I'll be really sore the next day, potentially, um, and then if I have to do a leg day on the Wednesday, am I gonna be fully recovered? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but having that full body set up, just again, allows for the intent, get the volume in, and just keeps it fun. Yeah. You know, it's like, cool, quad, done. Yeah. And like, again, having the lower, body, like lower body stuff first is usually like, whew, really focus in the beginning and get the hard part done mm-hmm. and not to say like oh the rest is easy but it's like okay now i, I don't have to worry too much about it mm-hmm. so i'm typically like oh i know my quads are going to be beat up yeah after these lunges uh, but after that it's, it's okay so it's, yeah helps. dude i think i think and even for like a lot of people that i coach within the gym here um i get a lot of them full body trainings when they're doing like one to four sessions a week of mm-hmm. training 
because I know that for a lot of them, their, their lives and their consistency with training is all over the place. So like one week they'll do four sessions, the next week they do one. And if that one session they do that week is just like a push session, mm-hmm. they've missed all of the pulling, all the legs for that whole week. And I'm like, oh, but we, we, we could do better. We could just do a full body session and get some level of stimulus across the whole body every single week, no matter what, even if you only did one or two sessions that week. Mm-hmm. So I think for people who have like really um, uh, up and down schedules and structure of their life, it's such a great way to train because every time you're getting stimulus. Um, but then the other thing for me, I think the reason I love it so much is that those like whether we like it or not those lower body sessions are brutal if we're just going into a, do a, a straight up leg day where we're doing squats and leg press and leg extensions and leg curls and calf raises or lunges or whatever it like you said the the quality of work towards the end of the session is, is going down and down and down um and there's this whole this whole like kind of ideology around like like leg days like you gotta crush it you gotta like crawl out of the gym and if you're not sore for like the whole week you haven't done it right and i'm like mm-hmm do I really want to be sore for the whole week? Like if I do a leg day, do I really like when I walk my dog two days later, do I want to be like limping up the hill? Like how is that actually improving my life? And I want to train for enjoyment and I want to train for um, functionality. And I want to to train for like, I want to still be able to do the things I want to do in my life, right? So it's like, I just don't see like, it's this, um, it's like this macho like bravado thing of like, you got to freaking crush a leg day. But I just think majority of people end up skipping it because they're like, it's so freaking hard. And so what if we just said, hey, look, I'm going to take that leg day and I'm going to put all of those exercises into one of your workouts throughout the week. Mm-hmm. And I said this to one of the guys um, a while ago and he was like, he wasn't training legs. I was like, hey, dude, like on each day you come into the gym, can you just jump on the leg extension and do three sets? Mm-hmm. And he's like, yeah, I could probably do that. I was like, great, do that. Because like that's like you're still training your legs like it doesn't have to be a leg day so i love that way of doing it and it means that every time i come in i'm not like walking in anticipating doing all of this leg volume i'm like i'm going to crush this this like four sets of lunges with really good intent like you're saying it's going to be way more way higher quality than if i was doing a leg day um and then i get to go do my my incline press and my pull downs and my curls and i'm a happy boy right so I think it's a, a great way to train. Yeah, and, and it's not to say that it's the only way to train. And, and, and there's, there's, there's multiple ways, obviously, to go about it. But it's like when you look at what the research says in terms of setting up training, like there was that great meta-analysis and systematic review by, from Krieger, James Krieger, and it was like more than 10 sets of the same muscle group per exercise. Anything more than 10 is junk volume or mm-hmm. it doesn't, it's not as stimulating for hypertrophy. For, for one session. Yeah, yes. yeah, so one session. So if I'm doing a leg day and say I'm doing three sets of three uh, there's just three sets of everything by like the fourth exercise I'm gonna be toast one mm. so I'm not I might not be getting the most out of it for each for for that session so like why it's junk volume technically or just why why bother and that combined with the, they're saying like the two times so Schoenfeld saying two times per week frequency mm-hmm. is usually better than one mm-hmm. so like combine those two things like yeah like you don't want to have just one leg day per per week you, you could split up into two because you could do like an upper lower split it could mm-hmm. be a push pull lower split it could be anything but a full body is just another way to do that whereas you're still getting the total vo- total volume per week so say like you're getting 15 sets per muscle group you can do that with full body it could just be like okay five days a week three sets each each session that covers it there or if you're doing say two or th- two sessions three sessions for that there's just five four or two like, there's just different ways to do it yeah so, like by having those those guidelines of two times a week frequency uh, anywhere between 10 to 20 sets and zero to four reps in reserve. Like again, like simple training. Like yeah. as long as I check those boxes off in mm-hmm. my training and when I'm coaching others, that's good. If one week, that means you're training three times a week. That's good. One yeah. week you're training six times a week. That's okay too. Yeah. You know, we should be a little bit more flexible. Totally. We should be, uh, you should have some, some, some path obviously. And depending on the person, but it's like we can, it's not as difficult or strict as we, we think it needs to be. Yeah. You know I mean, like check those, t- check those boxes of the most important things and have fun. Yeah. I think it, it takes like a, it takes a good coach, a coach that can think critically and also identify the personal preferences and lifestyle factors of a client to be able to structure a program like this rather than like, I think a lot of coaches in the industry, you just go to them and they'll be like, you're going to do this program because we all train like this. Right. Whereas you could, you could, you can design a program in so many different ways to probably produce a similar result, but it's like, what's going to be the most enjoyable for the person and how are they going, like how, what's the, what's the percentage, I guess, um, 
uh, well, how how well can they actually stick to this program, yeah. right? Can they adhere to it? Is like, the big question. Yeah, like you said, it could be very scary for people to say oh, leg day. I mean, you see all the memes and, and it's, like, the, it's, the memes, it's like, oh, yeah, it's the memes. Yeah, it's the memes. Yeah, meme meme culture sometimes really uh, affects people like us. Like, we're <laughs> yes. trying to get people training. Stop saying if you're not throwing up on leg day, it doesn't even matter. That's oh, right. Oh no, leg day. <laughs> Call an ambulance, but yeah. not for me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just, I mean, so many memes, but it's like. That actually can sometimes get people scared to do leg days. Like, oh no, it's it's the scariest thing. But it's like, well, yeah, sure. If you're doing a, a one day legs and you're trashing yourself, that's that's scary. But you don't need to do that. You know what I mean? Like, it's a mm. full body. You can do mm-hmm. three times a week. Like, there's so many ways to do it. Yeah, to man. make it feasible. Yeah, and enjoyable. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I guess like one. I guess final thing I'd like to touch on with you, bro, is um, the use of reps and reserve or RPE. Yeah. Um, and probably people who have been following my Instagram for a while will know a little bit about it. Mm-hmm. But probably like I think for like the general population, it's still one of those things when they get a program, it's not actually listed. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't give them an idea of how hard they should actually train. Yeah. If you're following like a generic uh, a generic program you got offline, it's not going to give you the exact weights to lift. So if it doesn't give you the exact weights to lift for those exercises because it doesn't know your personal situation, then how, how are you supposed to know how hard you're supposed to train? And I think that's where like having some kind of target of like reps and reserve mm-hmm. is just such a good thing for people to know. Cause it's like, I don't actually need to know what weight I need to lift for this exercise. I just need to go through a little bit of trial and error to find a weight that's gonna allow me to hit this rep range mm-hmm. with this intensity. And then that's the weight I'm gonna, that, that's the weight, right? Yeah. So I guess for you, bro, like what would be some suggestions for people who are new to RPE or reps and reserve and how can they better gauge that for themselves? Yeah, yeah. So it's it's tough because there's a couple different ways you can go about it. Um, so I, I did some my master's thesis looking at accuracy of RPE with with uh, trained individuals in the squat, bench, and deadlift, and it was really cool because we actually had them do reps to failure with eighty percent on those lifts in four sets. So that, like one day it'd be squats, then like a week later it'd be bench, then a week after Super deadlift. Super brutal. Yeah, it's, it's brutal but doable. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's like squat as many reps as you can, 80%, rest up to five minutes, then again, then to the four sets total. And they were told to shout out when they thought that they had four reps in reserve and then one rep in reserve. Mm. So they would just go, squat, squat, four, go, 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 one, and then go till maximal effort. So that means like they 10 RPE so they couldn't do anymore or maybe they failed the rep but just maximal effort uh and then we looked back and saw how accurate that was so when they said they had four reps left did they do four did they do five did they do three and same thing with the one rep did they do one zero two maybe and combine all that together and looking at how accurate it was and the differences between the squat the bench and the deadlift between set one to set four and overall we saw that people were actually really good at gauging they're actually especially with these these lifts right like squat bench stuff because sometimes there's not that much literature out there in terms of like rpe accuracy there was in like a, a chest press machine uh, and a leg press machine but in terms of like the bigger lifts not so much so okay. it was cool to like, kind of get that in there Great. and seeing that people are actually accurate with it because one of the big things people say that is a fault of rp is that people aren't good at gauging it right and that's 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 can be accurate mm-hmm. that could be true um but like when it comes down to it, especially some more the more trained people they're, they're pretty accurate and, ac- and accurate as in like less than one rpe off for pretty much all the lifts and even more accurate so they're more accurate the closer to failure they are so like the one rep in reserve is more accurate than the four reps in reserve uh and the less reps total that they did the more accurate they were so typically set four again they would maybe do five reps whereas set one it could be nine so the more less reps would be more accurate because again you have an idea of what failure is like gotcha um so this so that was really cool to see and what that means for in terms of other people gauging uh, RPE. So one, another interesting finding was that use of RPE didn't necessarily correlate with higher accuracy. Mm. So if you use RPE, that didn't mean you were good at it. If you oh, didn't, it didn't necessarily mean you were not good at yeah. it. The biggest thing was training age in total. So we did see some significance there. So people who train for longer were typically more accurate with mm-hmm. it, whether or not they used RPE or not. Mm-hmm. So just more so understanding yourself as a lifter. Uh, and what true effort is, mm. is is a big thing too uh, and if you're maybe not so good with that or maybe you're a lower training age or you just never used rpe um, you could potentially use something like an amrap so do as many reps as you can to see what true effort is like it's mm-hmm. like oh yeah and then maybe if you want to shout out what you think your rp is at you could probably do that too so like having your coach there saying like i think it's four i go and do four more left and then you do 10 you're mm. like oh 
Maybe yes. I was wrong. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so maybe, you know, testing, it, it, it doesn't have to be four sets. It doesn't have to be something crazy and it doesn't have to be too maximum effort. It, 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 it would be beneficial to, but doing something like that can be useful. Hey, just do one set. And especially maybe on like more, less like dangerous exercise. So it doesn't have to be on the squat. It can be if, if that's something you want to be more accurate with your RP, it could be. Um, but mm-hmm. if you're maybe new to it and you're a little bit scared to do a barbell squat, maybe a leg press where it's safer or maybe a leg extension where it's also safer, where it's like, you just can't do it. That's okay. There's mm-hmm. not much of a risk to it. Um, so actually seeing what true effort is like can help you with gauging RP typically. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. It's something I use with some of my, if I've got like someone coming in to do like a, a form check session or something. And then I'm also like, Hey, do you know how to use like reps and reserve? Um, and usually they don't, but it's a case of just going, Hey, look, well with the set, I'm going to get you to go, um, basically we're going to have this rep range and then like you were saying I'm going to get you to shout out when you got like two reps in reserve just let me know when you think you can only do two more and I'm like okay cool now let's keep going like as many as you can keep going keep going and like often it's the case I I think like you said it's like the the younger your training age like the less you've had of training experience the less accurate you're going to be like it's yeah. pretty obvious but like I think if I can get someone within their first like six months of training and teach them like reps in reserve and go hey look this is kind of the level of intensity I want you to train at. Like if they're only training twice a week, then I can actually get them to be training with enough inten- intensity to, to see the response they want. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great tool to use and something more people should probably, you know. And the biggest thing is it's utilize. anyone can use it. Mm-hmm. So again, like from the beginning, I say I like to do research that can actually help people and that people, anyone can use. If you just started training, if you're higher up in the training, it's like I want to be able to put content and, and, and science out there that's like, anyone can use it like you listen to it or you see the paper come out and then the next day you can use it like rp and that's just so so you there's no barrier in terms of money whereas because like people always compare using velocity so seeing how fast you're moving with these devices and and that it can be more it can be better than rp um but not everyone has two thousand dollars to spend on a velocity tracker or maybe less or more uh, and what's cool about the study that i did too and we're doing a side paper which actually should be coming out soon where they're showing that RP actually correlates pretty well with velocity. Mm-hmm. So like typically people be like, okay, when you're two reps in reserve, your velocity on your squat is roughly 0.37 to 0.4 meters per second. That's not exactly what it is, but this is an example. So it's like, okay, well, if you're telling people to use velocity and they're supposed to be at 0.3 meters for their 0.37 for their two reps in reserve, if they don't have that, they can just be at an eight RP. Right. And if we know they're accurate with it and we know it can correlate well with velocity, mm-hmm this is the tool that everyone can use. So right. it's a little bit more. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's cool. Cause it's, again, it's useful for, for multiple people. And just, again, if you're not that used to it, just, just start and yeah. you'll get better as you go. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, but it's cool. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we've covered like a stack in this yeah, episode, yeah. dude. Is there anything you wanted to touch on um, specifically before I sort of hit you with the final question? Mm, nothing specific. No, it's just that like, again, I know we threw like a lot of information out there and uh-huh. it's not to say like things are, like things can be intricate if you need to, but the, when it comes down to it, making things simple and, and not overcomplicating things is always mm-hmm. always a big takeaway. Mm-hmm. Because like, yes, we can get into the super intricacies of like what's the best thing for muscle hypertrophy, but for like when it comes down to it, what's what's feasible? What's what are you gonna stick to? Um, and just not like getting caught in the paralysis by over analysis part, which is very common, especially nowadays. Everyone's like, well, I follow all these uh, fit fitness influencers and they say this, then this person says that. And now it's team this versus team that. I don't know what to believe in. Man, just stick to the, stick to those guidelines. And like the guidelines saying like this rep range, like eight to 12, like six to 20 reps is, is a pretty big range. Zero to four reps in reserve and just do enough, like 10 to 20 sets. You stick to that and you do it over long term. Like that's simple, simplified training and train hard, have fun. Like that's it. Don't, don't overthink it. You can if you want, but if that becomes a negative, then don't. <laughs> well, dude, I'm, I'm with you 100%. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome, bro. So I guess uh, the, the final question I'd like to ask um, a lot of our guests is, um, and it's not training related at all, is what is one eye-opening experience you think all humans should have? Ooh. Yeah. I'll pick a different one because I think we already talked about being a participant in research. Ah, I do think that is... That's an like, eye-opening experience? I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah it really is. It's really cool. And yeah, I think so. Another one though... Um, Oh man, that's a that's a tough. I hope yeah. everyone should experience. It's a big question, bro. Yeah, yeah. I like um, it though. I do like. It. I like it too. I think spending, like truly spending time with yourself, not, not a, like being alone, not necessarily being lonely, but truly being with yourself. Because mm. um, I mean, over 
over my time of like my whole journey, it's been like, I've been, I mean, I'm in an opposite side of the world right now. <laughs> and it's like hard to, to do that and hard to, to, to find friends and like balance work, life, school, fun, yeah, balance everything. But like being alone, like people always have the stigma that being alone means you're lonely or that it's bad. Um, but really, like I would entice people to try to be alone so that you can really come to find yourself and love yourself. Uh, because when you are alone, it's like, okay, like I said, talk to yourself. I talk to myself all the time, maybe too much, especially in public. I should probably be careful. Uh, but it's okay. I'm cool. Uh, but, but to be able to be okay with that and knowing like, yeah, like, let me talk to myself. Like, how am I feeling? And what does that mean to like, what do these feelings mean? And like, is it okay to feel this way? And being comfortable with truly like being yourself. But I think like being alone and having and enjoying that time being alone with yourself is something that people should, should probably try to experience. Oh, and not so much of a negative thing to it. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that, bro. I'm surprised that was a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where'd yeah. you pull that one from, man? That's because, like, again, I, I've experienced that. And it's, like, something I, like, sometimes Sundays I spend all the time alone. I'm like, man, I love it. I don't speak a word out loud sometimes on, like, Sundays just because, like, I'm not really talking to people. I'm just yeah. out walking around doing totally. these things. And it's like, that's okay. Oh, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I love, I mean, I'm the kind of guy who's, like, I'm, I'm social when I need to be and I like being around people, but then I also... I really value and I need time with myself. Yeah. Like, and if I don't get it, like if I'm traveling with somebody or with a group of people and like we're with each other all the time mm -hmm. and I don't get like an hour or two or like maybe I go off and train somewhere on my own or whatever. If I don't get that, like I, I feel like uh, my levels of like, I don't know, stress or anxiety start to raise and raise and raise. Yeah. Um, and I become more irritable and not nice to be around. Mm -hmm. And I just need that solo time to I'm gonna come back to myself and maybe I can do some mindfulness or I can I can do some yoga or I can go for a walk or train or whatever and I, I find that so important for me. Um, but yeah, it's it's getting away from that stigma of like of being alone is means you're lonely or you don't have friends or you know, so I think learning yeah like you said learning to be with yourself because yeah, when you know your true self you can be your true self mm. around others because then mm -hmm. like you don't have to put on sometimes a front yeah so it's just you and you you know I mean? like who are you trying to impress colby no one yeah, yeah. Like, or, or whoever like, you know it's just because then when you know like yeah like, i actually love the person that i am and yeah. like, i came to that conclusion by being alone and really thinking about it and like having those like and like deep critical thinking sessions by myself it's like yeah, yeah. i get it. like who am i what does that mean to me what are my values and how does that play a role in me and then going out and portraying that as my actual self like i love being myself sometimes mm. that's like too crazy for people i'm like too energetic or too much for someone that's okay that's me that's cool. just what you'll get you won't get a fake person you know hell yeah man yeah. freaking awesome so <laughs> do you want to plug some stuff bro let people know where they can find you what, where I can, I can tell find them me. tell them to watch an anime show yeah um <laughs> i'm not the greatest with social media but i think that's also like a big part of who i am <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah but uh, I, I like that i do i think instagram is probably the, the place you can find me like if you message me i will respond it might take some time and i apologize in advance if you do reach out but i will reach out 100 percent uh and we'll, re we'll return the, the message but um my instagram is just colby like the cheese c-o-l-b-y a period or a full stop if this is we're in new zealand and then <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i'm learning all the things i'm still learning and susa s-o-u-s-a that's my my instagram handle and you can just find, like search that or on facebook or perfect my anime list on yes oh, no. <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah and i'm sure if they've yeah if they've got like i mean for the listeners if you've got some intricate like training um questions around all this kind of stuff i've been talking about just hit colby up because training nutrition you know, yeah. life like I, I i think it's important just to have just conversations with people again mm. we're humans at the end of the day and yeah, like interaction and be like me I, I love people like if you can't tell so it's like yeah reach out to me i'd love to just have a chat maybe I'll like meet up hop on Skype, whatever it is. Like, don't be afraid to reach out because I think like, you can make these connections with so many people, especially with the way social media is. Nowadays, we can we can have friends from across the world. Yes. And, and that's cool. So utilize that. Don't be afraid. I'm not scary. <laughs> I don't know. I've just been eight weeks with you, so. <laughs> Everything you said is a lie. <laughs> don't reach out. To yes. <laughs> yes. Well, bro, I think we're going to go get a lift in, man. Oh, yeah. It's about that time. Oh, the caffeine's. The yeah, we're down. <laughs> yeah, we need another another hit. Yeah. Um, hey, man, that was fun, bro. Thank you for coming yeah, out. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, keep doing what you're doing. You're doing an awesome job. Stuff, so. Thank you, man. Solid.